Well, thank you all for coming out. Uh, I'm Walter Lohman, director of the Asian Studies Center here at Heritage Foundation. Um, the, um, the topic of the discussion today, the health of the U.S.-India market relationship, um, it's actually something we've been focused on for a while. Um, I've got out front the, uh, the paper that we released uh, early this year, Unleashing the Markets in U.S.-India Relations. Hope you'll pick up a copy. Um, part of our... Um, you know, part of our intention here is to get more um, more focus on some of those issues that we raise in the in the, in the paper. Um, there's uh, there's also been a number. I don't. You must notice all the excitement on U.S. India economic relations. At least I hope so. Although I got to say, this town doesn't seem quite as excited about India as it was a few years ago. Um, but uh, now, unfortunately, a lot of it's on the negative side. I mean, you have uh, I brought. I'm not a prop guy. But I brought several of these letters with me. This is just in the last few weeks. Alliance for Fair Trade with India, which Linda represents. I'm not sure you were an alliance at that point, but it's all the same groups uh, complaining about the market in India. Letter from uh, the, the um, Finance Committee, letter from U.S. India Business Council, generally a cheerleader on India. I mean, it took years to get U.S. India Business Council to say something bad in public. Um, you have the uh, Ways and Means Committee put out a letter. I, I don't know. They must have. They've got 30 signatures or so on this letter. You got. Uh, um, you also have the Senate sent a letter a couple weeks ago. So there's there's a lot of negative attention on India lately. Um, that is focusing a, a fo focusing on some of the issues we've been trying to talk about now for a couple of years. So you know the positive approach hasn't worked. Maybe that negative approach will get attention to the issues, but. Um, so, so we've been thinking about doing a program like this, promoting the concepts in the paper, et cetera, for some time. The thing that really put me over the top and just, you know, made me think, okay, we got to do this, was uh, reading um, Swami Iyer's paper. Actually, I haven't told you that, but I, I went to your, uh, I went to the Cato uh, about a month ago, and on the way out, I picked up this paper, yet another prop, the uh, India and United States: How Individuals and Corporations Have Driven Indo-U.S. Relations. And uh, it really seems to me to put the finger on the central element in the relationship, and that is the relationship between businesses and the, the extent to which Indian investment in the U.S. has driven uh, India's profile here, changed, radically changed India's profile, and the way that the U.S. Uh, investment in India and, and trade with India has likewise changed American profile um, profile there. I think that is what underlies all the progress that we've made on the relationship in the last several years. I think way too much time is given to geostrategic uh, interests uh, that we may share with India. I don't think those are actually the things driving the relationship. And when you go and you talk to uh, um, MEA officials and others in India, you know, in the government, you know, if you're looking for geostrategic reasons for this relationship, you usually leave disappointed. And you can go to some private analysts and they'll give you what you need. They'll complain about China and that sort of thing. But the government is very circumspect when it comes to talking about China. Um, so, um, so, you know, that makes today's meeting all the more important because it is this economic relationship, this business-to-business -business, uh, relationship, market relationship that is driving the relationship. And if it is deteriorating, uh, then we've got a pretty big problem. So um, I'm glad to have um, Swami here, having uh, given me the inspiration. <laughs> and uh, I'm also really glad to have Sanjay Puri. Sanjay is a, uh, a co-host of today's program. He is founder and president of, uh, founder, president, and CEO of the Alliance for U.S.-India Business. Uh, the, the alliance is dedicated to strengthening economic ties between the U.S. and India. Um, uh, Sanjay is also chairman of... U US, uh, chairman of U.S. SyncPAC, uh, which is an independent bipartisan organization focused on um, the U.S.-India uh, relationship, but, but more broadly servicing the needs of the Indian American community here on the Hill. Uh, U.S. SyncPAC was a big mover behind the, the um, U.S. nuclear agreement, U.S.-India nuclear agreement, uh, something that really launched this new era in U.S.-India relations. Another area where I say the, the, the economic benefits have not yet <coughs> been materialized. Um, w w what I want to do is lead off with Sanjay, let him, uh, let him um, give his remarks, and then I'll come back and I'll introduce uh, the other panelists. We'll talk for a little bit and, and uh, open it up to Q&A.
Thank you. Send you whichever you whichever okay. prefer. Great. Thank you, Walter. Thanks to Heritage, and thank you all for coming. Uh, when Walter talked about uh, doing something together, I said, uh, given the names that we, uh, he suggested on the panel, I said I would do it just to be part of the audience. And I think we have uh, great panelists. He talked about uh, Swami, but also Linda, and uh, finally Derek, who is, um, I think some of you who have been here have heard him speak. But, uh, you know, I'm going to really let them talk about it. But um, as part of the Alliance for U.S.-India Business, uh, we have been doing um, efforts in taking small, medium-sized businesses from U.S. to India for the past 10 years, and the same from India to the U.S., because really the core, I think, opportunity is between these uh, <coughs> sectors. He talked about uh, optimism with the entrepreneurs. And the way we've been doing it is uh, states in the United States hire us uh, to take missions there, and we've done about 25. And within those 25 missions from here, and similar from there to here, there have been about 1,000 businesses that we have interacted with. And there are a few things that hopefully that we have learned um, over a period of time, and which hopefully I can share with you, and you will hear probably a lot more uh, on that point is, um, you know, the thing that I would say is there are four things, uh, four E's that I say you should focus on is education, energy, environment, and entrepreneurs. <coughs> in India. And when I say education, uh, you know, uh, India sends about over 100,000 students to the U.S. It's a three billion direct and indirect revenue source to us. But there is a other benefit that we get. Half the students probably stay here and become valuable uh, citizens, entrepreneurs uh, to this country. Maybe half of them go back. And studies have shown that U.S. educated uh, students who go back, whether it's in their companies, as businessmen, uh, they are much more receptive uh, to U.S.-India trade. And if you look at some of the biggest companies today in India, whether it's Reliance or others, they are run by U.S. educated uh, CEOs, and their companies in many ways are U.S. facing. So I think that's a big uh, plus, and I think we should continue to do that. Uh, India also has a big education market. Um, it's a $50 billion market with the demographics they have. Uh, the foreign uh, education bill is never going to get through parliament. I mean, you know, if, uh, and the other thing is uh, that just is not going to happen. Uh, given the work that we've done in education, I can tell you there's a tremendous lobby against it. But also they are requiring $11 million in investment. I don't think any university here is going to say, I'm going to put 11 million, I can never get it repatriated back because I'd love to build a campus in India while Qatar is going to give me 50 million to put a campus there. This, it's just not going to happen. But there are other opportunities, especially when you look at online and <coughs> things of that nature that can happen. And within education, uh, there's an area. Uh, in the 60s, the United States brought in physicians. We had physician shortages, especially in rural areas and other areas. I think. STEM teachers is another area that we can really work with India and in bringing them on a temporary J-1 visa. It helps us. It helps India, too, from the perspective of the exchange. Uh, coming to energy, that's been talked about now for a while. Uh, India needs energy. The U.S. has gas. Uh, the ambassador, the prime minister, everybody is talking about it. Uh, two Indian public sector companies have signed large contracts, Gale and Petronet. Um, these are large contracts, 20-year contracts for 4 million tons each. Uh, they are stuck because of Department of Energy. India is not an FTA country. Uh, now, you know, there are a lot of arguments. Heritage has uh, done a lot of things in there. But I would say if environmentally and economically it makes sense, this is also a way to geopolitically get India out from importing uh, oil from the Middle East. And also, it's economically viable for them. Plus, India is now starting to do shale energy uh, work themselves. And we have the technology. There's an opportunity for us to share, sell, whatever you want to call it. Uh, the third E is environment. India, if any of you uh, have been watching India, there's a water uh, crisis. There is a sanitation crisis with urbanization happening at a rapid pace. Uh, cities are crumbling and in terms of infrastructure, we have a unique opportunity with technology to really make a difference there and also obviously sell our products. And we've seen that in our missions, the successes that have happened. And the final point is on entrepreneurs. He talked about it. 
focus on the entrepreneurs because the entrepreneurs are the ones that are driving this push uh, between trade. When we put an American entrepreneur and an Indian entrepreneur, everything happens right. But when we put uh, an entrepreneur in front of a politician, things just get completely off track. So I would say the entrepreneurs, we have world-class entrepreneurs in India and world-class entrepreneurs here. I know countries like Taiwan and others really push entrepreneurs from here to go there. There has never been a push for medium-scale uh, entrepreneurs or businesses to go there. Now, we do it, the states pay for it, but states here are also facing budgetary issues. But it, we have to find <coughs> a way of taking mid-sized entrepreneurs from here to engage with India because, you know, Walter talked about it, uh, you know, when BRICS came out, the I in the BRICS was for the it country, the important country. Now it's for indifference because that's what uh, people are feeling, that, uh, you know, who cares? So I think we need to change that. A uh, couple of points uh, uh, to wrap up my uh, talk is also focus on states. Most people make a big mistake that if you think you go to Delhi and Delhi is going to solve your problems. There are progressive states in India, uh, many of them, you know, Maharashtra, Gujarat, Tamil Nadu, Andhra Pradesh, etc., where the chief ministers are progressive and they really want to get things done and they really are trying to get things done. So, Delhi, there's nothing going to happen. I saw what uh, Secretary Kerry had gone there and the big announcements, et cetera, and I laud him for that. But this government is basically in election mode. So uh, I presume you all understand where it all is going to end up. So go to the states. And in India, one thing we've learned the hard way, there's only one man who can make a decision, whether it's in a company or it's in a state or it's in the country. So. Make sure you talk to that one man who can make a decision because you might be thinking you're talking to the decision maker, but you're actually not. Because uh, if, if micromanagement was a term, India invented that because they believe in micromanagement in reliance. If there's a 10,000 rupee expense, it kind of has to be approved by Mukesh Ambani. So I would talk to the key decision maker. So, but let there not be pessimism, as they say, you know, Elephants can dance, but they can dance slowly. Things happen a little slowly, so let's not be that okay. pessimistic. With that, I'll turn it back over to you. Okay, great, great. Thank you, Sanjay. Well, it's fitting that we start out on an optimistic note, because I'm afraid that is we're not going to stay there for that, <laughs> for that log. Um, but, you know, I mean, I hope, I hope folks, uh, you know, friends here will understand that it's coming from the right place. I mean, we're, we're critical here on India because we want the relationship to be so much more and we want the opportunity to actually uh, be realized. Um, I'm going to turn it over to Linda McGetty Dempsey. Uh, I'm not used to saying those three. Um, Linda is Vice President of International Economic Affairs at National Association of Manufacturers. She's also, as I mentioned uh, in my opening, co-chair of the Alliance for Fair Trade with India, a new group um, a coalition of trade associations in Washington working on uh, market access issues, uh, mostly as I read it, and she can tell us more about that. Mm -hmm. uh, Linda was uh, was also was formerly a vice president emergency committee for American Trade, uh, the title she had last time she was here, and she was uh, trade counsel on the finance committee. I think the first time we met. Yeah, I won't say how long ago that was. Wow. So with that, uh, let me turn it over to you, Linda. Thank you, Walter, and it really is a pleasure and honor to be here today. On uh, behalf of the National Association of Manufacturers, for those who might not know, we represent about 12,000 small, medium, and large companies that manufacture in every state of the United States and um, in every sector of the manufacturing economy. Um, I, I, I agree so much with what Walter and Sanji have said about the desire for optimism, the desire for um, our businesses, our manufacturers to grow and, Im, you know, uh, improve the U.S.-India relationship. And over time, we've we've seen that 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 opening, you know. India and the United States were co-founders of the General Agreement on Tariffs and Trade, along with about 20 other countries, back in 1948. Um, that it, in itself is, is a remarkable achievement. And, and as the GATT grew and grew into the World Trade Organization, um, India and the United States worked closely together, not always agreeing on issues, but, you know, by 1995, when the WTO um, entered into force, uh, 
there was more in common, I believe, than, than, than not. We saw then, of course, the inability of the WTO uh, for a number of reasons, but partly, I, I, I will say, it was differences between the outlook of the United States on the one hand, India on the other, you know, there's Brazil, there's, there's China, there's uh, the EU, there's other actors there, and, you know, a much bigger decision-making um, struggle. Um, so the rules that govern the U.S.-India trade and relationship are just those baseline WTO rules that we have with, you know, over 150 other countries. We have tried, and, and we have dialogues and, and other smaller types of arrangements, um, but nothing not the broader type of uh, relationship and sustained uh, developed economic relationship that the United States has forged with others and, and India has forged with others. Uh, in 2008, many of us were very pleased to see the launch of bilateral investment treaty negotiations between the United States and India. Here was a way, I think many here in the United States thought that, that we were going to be able to regular, regularize this relationship, grow cross border investment to the mutual benefit of both our economies and, and manufacturers and, and workers and service providers uh, in, in both economies. Um, we had a change in government here in the United States. The Obama administration took a few years to review our model, bilateral investment treaty template, uh, which then came out in, in April of 2012. Uh, somewhere along that process, uh, there have been, there's been some sessions between the U.S. and Indians, but the Indian government decided to relook at its model, a model that I would say from, from a U.S. business perspective uh, was already fairly weak, didn't include many of the things that, that we um, would like to see. Uh, you know, there's long-standing uh, investment treaties India has with many European countries that are fairly strong, but, there, but there's innovations, I think, that the U.S. has brought to the table. Um, and so, the, you know, those negotiations have been on hold. Um, we, I, I think, and I'll, I can only speak really for manufacturers, but a lot of this is true in, in services and other areas. You know, as India started to really open its economy in the in the 90s, there was hope and optimism and stronger ties, relationships, trade flows, investment flows growing. And we now have a $60 billion manufacturing trading relationship. Um, the U.S., uh, as of 2011, I don't have the newest numbers, you know, invested um, nearly $25 billion in India, about $3.5 in manufacturing. Um, while India's economy and trade presence has grown in recent years, um, it has not, frankly, and, and the U.S.-India commercial relationship has not reached the potential that many had hoped. Um, we in the United States have seen challenges in the Indian market, very high tariffs. As an original member of the GATT, it didn't do the type of accession process that China did. And so India has on the books much higher tariffs uh, than any of the newly exceeding countries. Um, intellectual property has long been a very uh, different perspective for our two countries, but from, from the U.S. side and, and as, you know, for manufacturers, I will just say there is no issue that I think joins my um, the companies that I work with at the NAM on international trade than the need to protect and enforce intellectual property rights. Every ma virtually every manufacturer grows its business, is globally competitive and competitive here because of, of those basic what we would call property rights. And so, you know, we've seen, you know, a, a difficult time, but we, we, we tried. Um, India, by international terms, when you look at something like the World Bank doing business report, has remained relatively low. Um, in the last ranking, it was 132 out of 185 <coughs> countries, uh, below all the other BRIC nations, um, you know, neighboring Pakistan, Nepal. Um, the Global Economic <coughs> Forum, uh, the World Economic Forum, WEF, puts out a global enabling report every um, two years. And India is uh, listed as 100 out of 132 countries in terms of 
how much its economy, how much its, its trade structure enables trade flows and investment flows back and forth, below China, below Indonesia, even below Argentina. Um, and so within, while there was much difficulty, I think manufacturers, others in the U.S. business community have continued to try for a long time to, to work uh, with India and, and the, the work that you talked about, I, I think is, is hugely important and the, the entrepreneurial relationships. But what we have seen in the last 18 months, and there is no issue that I hear more about in, in the last month at, at, at my group, is government actions by the Indian government that are turning backwards and are making the ability to forge that stronger commercial relationship almost impossible. Um, there are a number of different actions that I would call discriminatory. And I say discriminatory against U.S. exports, U.S. manufacturers, U.S. innovation. But of course, it's not just applied against the United States. It's, it's anything foreign. But I represent the U.S. business group, so I'll, that's where I, I will start. Um, We've seen local content requirements. We've seen um, movement backwards on already weak intellectual property and other property protections. Um, India's preferential market access rules, for instance, would impose local content requirements on the procurement of information and communication technology products <clears throat> by not only the government and private sector entities. We can talk later about Buy America and all of that. It is, it is absolutely different. Right? The United States' procurement market is open, with exceptions, to the procurement markets of other countries that agree to reciprocal opening. India has not negotiated that agreement in the WTO, and its, market is, its procurement market is much closed. But what is so concerning is the application of these measures on private entities, which is absolutely contrary to the baseline rules we all agreed to 65 years ago. The clean energy sector and solar, um, one of our member associations was talking about this yesterday. Um, the local content requirements, you've seen the United States bring a World Trade Organization case on this. Um, you know, energy, an important area for, for both our country's development. As manufacturers here, we use about a third of our nation's energy. Yes, affordable energy should be important to everyone. And so local content requirements that make it more costly uh, provide less innovative um, outcomes and technologies doesn't seem to be the type of policy that um, is in either of our country's interests. We've seen bans on remanufactured products from imports, and but yet those products can be remanufactured in India, uh, a pretty blatant to me uh, sort of protectionist move. And then on intellectual property, um, where I, I know our governments have different views, but as I said, there is no issue that is more important to growing manufacturing than strong intellectual property protections. And so the revocation, compulsory licensing, denial of patents um, is just an affront to the global system. Um, it is part of this broader industrial policy. I've seen some of the back and forth, well, you know, this is access to medicines. It is not. Most of these products are already supplied free of charge or low cost to very limited numbers of consumers in India. These products are being um, now made by Indian companies uh, and sold not just in India, at fairly significant costs, by the way, to Indian consumers, um, but also around the world. We've seen discriminatory tax, barriers in foreign investment, uh, ICT infrastructure. This you know, we in the business community here, and the reason we formed the Alliance for Fair Trade with India, you know, are basically what we're hearing is enough and enough is enough. We can't do business as much as many of our companies want to when the government imposes these types of restrictions. We all understand and support India in its uh, desire to grow its economy and its manufacturing economy, you know. That is the mission of my organization, the National Association of Manufacturers, to grow 
manufacturing here in the United States. But we seek a policy that attracts investment, doesn't try to force it. One of our key tenets is the innovation economy through the protection of property rights, including intellectual property, and market-driven processes so that entrepreneurs can work with entrepreneurs to decide what those right technologies are. We don't steal others' technologies and intellectual property. Um, we want to, you know, affordable energy is a huge um, issue that I don't deal with in my office, but is obviously important to manufacturers here in India, around the world. Imposing restraints, doing things that undermine uh, the growth of that energy is counterproductive. Um, so all the letters that, that Walter um, showed, I mean, there were over 250 members of Congress who wrote to the U.S. government in the last two weeks alone to say enough is enough. We want you, Secretary Kerry, to raise this issue. We understand he has. We've requested a meeting with the State Department to follow up. We obviously have other um, opportunities. Minister Sharma is coming to Washington, D.C. There's the, the U.S.-India CEO dialogue. Our Vice President is going to India, and of course the Indian Prime Minister is coming to the United States in September. We want to view these as opportunities to put this relationship back on track. We need to see an immediate cessation of these policies. More dialogue, because there's been lots of dialogue, right? Business has talked about this for a while. There's been lots of letters over the PMA and all of these issues. Our government has been talking with the Indian government about these issues for a long time. We need to see action and results. And so that's what we're looking to see. Let me stop there. Great, thank you. Let me let me just say a couple words of introduction for you, Swami. Um, I mentioned you in the outset. Uh, you you write pretty broadly on U.S. India economic relations, and maybe you'll give us some perspective in that regard today. Um, Swami is research fellow at the Cato Institute with a special focus on India and Asia. Um, he's a prolific columnist and TV commentators in India. Uh, well known, he has a well known column um, called Swaminomics and <laughs> column in, in the uh, in the Times of India. I also say you're a pretty good market guy too, because <laughs> you've got at least one other book with the word Swaminomics in it. I think um, the um, uh, Swami has uh, also been editor of India's two biggest financial dailies, uh, the Economic Times and the Financial Express. Uh, with that, let me turn it over to you and yeah, please. India is a country without any ideological liberalizers whatsoever. Uh, that may be an exaggeration. Manmohan Singh, in some slight sense, may have an ideological thing. Only one guy, and he's not really in politics. He was brought in for a particular crisis and sort of hang on forever, as happens in India. But among the political class, there are no ideological liberalizers. India was fundamentally socialist, fundamentally state driven for a long time. The, the results were not disastrous, but not terrible, but uh, obviously were unsatisfactory. In 1991, India finally went bust. The real reason India went for economic reform, it was not that there were some bright new guys with the ideas for liberalization. It's just as you know, we've been on this path for so long. Where do we now go now that we've gone comprehensively bust? We've been following the Soviet model, but the Soviet model is just collapsing. It was a coincidence, if you like, 1991. India went bust and the Soviet Union went bust at the same time. So then the question was, but you know, there's this other thing called China. And Deng Xiaoping has shown that, you know, the state is important, but you can go towards the market. Let's try that. Complete lack of conviction there was in that particular point of time. I remember my brother, who was a Congress party politician, saying, you know, uh, you say when you liberalize, we will do well. I mean, which are the areas we will do well in? I said, the whole point of the market is that you can't predict it. It's on the basis that you have no idea where you're going to succeed. You say that this is going to be the right path. I said, yes. I mean, he sneered. I mean, he found it utterly implausible that this is the right way to go. When you consider the faith and state guidance and saying, you know, you must know where you, where you want to go. But this was the country that in some sense began liberalization. Hesitant, no ideological thing, very, very pragmatic here and there. To the surprise of, I think, both those who were in favor like me and those who were against it, it succeeded very quickly. 
You got a 7.5% growth within three years. And because it had worked, it stayed. But it stayed without any great conviction, ideological force behind it. What you did get is they said, well, you know, the old system wasn't working. We, we, we haven't burst and it can't work. So what do we do next? So in some sense, the political message that went out to the bureaucracy was that, you know, we keep asking the question, what can we liberalize next? And if it flies, it flies. If it doesn't fly, it doesn't fly. And so in a patchy manner, India liberalized bit by bit uh, over a very long period to many people's surprise. This process, I would say, came to an end in 2008. It came to an end not just because there was a deep recession. I think at, uh, at 2008, when people said, why is it that India survived this great financial crisis and didn't get tainted, didn't collapse like the other, they said, you know, this is because we had such a strongly regulated financial sector that, you know, we didn't go bust. And look at all those guys, they are saying that they made a terrible mistake. There's too much of the market. We must have much more regulation. You know, we've gone too far on this. We now have to go in the other direction. I would say from 2008 onwards, the bureaucracy, which in its own wooden way, just looking for political signals, it changed from what do we liberalize next to what do we regulate next. Uh, this is a very broad, anecdotal way of looking at it. But, you know, that is what you're really seeing. There is a change from 2008. After 2008, because of the crisis, I mean, I see these protectionist trends in every country. It's undoubtedly there in, in India, as you're pointing out. Equally, I, I see it in the United States. I see, I, I, I see it in many other countries. When I see the, you know, on the one hand, you're complaining that you can't export solar panels to India. On the other hand, the kind of duties you're putting on Chinese imports. Uh, the hypocrisy is so patent that it draws laughter in India. The idea that the United States has a case here, I mean, it's a joke. Mm. Uh, you know, you, no, you can argue it either way. All I'm saying is the notion that the United States <laughs> believes in free, you hear you have an Obama administration dying to do all kinds of things for the green industry. You know, law, common, common sense people will say, look, America is very good at high-tech, uh, tailor-made stuff. But if it's mass manufacture, frankly, they won't, can't do it. A third world country will do it. And if you want to have solar panels, you know, it's got to be mass manufactured. America will never be able to do mass manufacture. I mean, this is very broadly the picture. And, you know, it's just seen that, you know, this is a hypocritical country doing various things. Uh, but that's a small thing. The biggest bone of contention, as Linda said, is on IPR. And it is on IPR because in terms of seeing where is the horror, high moral ground, this is the gap is unbridgeable. I was at this uh, at the Rayburn building two days ago, Georgetown University, mm -hmm. having a particular discussion, and that was really feisty. It wasn't this kind of friendly argument. Guy, ah, you haven't right. heard Derek yet. Yeah, yeah. 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 Wait, <laughs> wait. <laughs> yeah. But I mean, you had the American notion that there is something called intellectual property rights, which are being violated. Say, Excuse me, you're in India. What do you mean intellectual property rights? What is intellectual? I mean, if I say, I love you, the sky is blue, tum, 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 I can get a pet. It doesn't have to be intellectual, actually. It's anything creative. You call it a property right. It's a temporary monopoly license. The moment you say temporary monopoly license, it ceases to be a kind of very high moral ground kind of thing. But really saying, you know, monopolies are bad things. Normally, we have put guys in jail for this. But, you know, because of the need for creativity, a certain limited amount of monopoly licenses to be given reluctantly when it's really important. But not property and not a right. Let's be very clear. I know the first words were created in the West, but it's, I mean, I would say to call it intellectual property rights is a large paint of gold on top of lead to try and bruise it up. I said, it is a monopoly license which, in my view, is necessary uh, in certain exceptional circumstances for things like promoting innovation, but you need to have a high bar. Secondly, let's be quite clear, intellectual property has nothing to do with free trade. So when the Uruguay round was being negotiated, the United States said, we are going to bring intellectual property rights in. Excuse me, what does this have to do? You kindly look at the charter of the IMF, we look at charter of the No, I mean, there's no way to, uh, intellectual property comes in. But this is a very clear case of very strong countries who basically were running the international system. And the poorer developing countries till then had been getting a free ride. So when the rich countries said, look, to make the system, we have to bring this in. And even if you say it's not logically in, and you will find a very large number of free trading economists 
like Jagdish Bhagwati, very, very strongly agrees. They say, what does intellectual property, what does this patent stuff have to do with, with trade? But they say, okay, since this is seen as a fulcrum to get any further, and we'll, we'll bring it in. But it will be brought in subject to a whole series of limitations, without which, frankly, it would not have gone through. I suddenly find in the United Nations, in the United States, the attitude seems to be that these limitations are either illusory or amount to breaking the law. I mean, the, somebody, the, two days ago, the guy was saying, yeah, we, take, we must take India to the WTO. I said, absolutely, let's go to the WTO. We will call you a bluff. Most of the stuff that they're saying is complete crap. The idea that putting a compulsory <laughs> license is against WTO rules, I said, excuse me, are you aware of what those rules are? This is very much allowed. Price controls, very much allowed. We are, there was, uh, you can have a difference of view on how far a thing is innovative or not innovative, and this is left to the sovereign judgment of, of the countries. It is the idea that because a United States court decides on some particular standard, that this is applicable to the whole world, excuse me. This is a delusion of grandia on the part of the United States of America. They said, on intellectual property rights, in terms of who has a high moral ground, in India, they would say, we have the high moral ground. What, what, what do you think you are trying to oppose? Now, all the American attempt to, you know, this, you know, piracy copying, I mean, a lot of that stuff, again, is just wrong. Uh, the idea that a production of the generic drugs is just some kind of piracy or copying, excuse me. If it was so, I mean, if I, I can give you a, a Ford motor car. Can you produce a copy of it tomorrow? No. Reverse engineering a drug is high tech. Not every country could do it. Through the ages, nobody could do it. Could be done only very recently. Secondly, once you, that, as far as that's the, uh, the product is concerned, there is a the question of how do you produce it more and more efficiently. This is the example I gave these two days ago. I said when the first thing arose on HIV retroviral drugs, I mean Merck was producing this thing and selling it in America at fifteen thousand uh, dollars for a standard treatment, which obviously was completely unaffordable. Uh, and so various third world countries, including Sipla and India, began to produce it. And Gil Martin and Merck went up, oh, my things be stolen. He said, okay, I will give it at cost to the people. My cost is only, you know, 1,500, 90% off. I'm going to give it to you $1,500. Mr. Hamid of Sipla said, excuse me, I can already produce it at 900, and I'm making a profit. And other people, Medicine Sans Frontiers, Said, so forget this. You know, you have you have competition between these guys on improving the processes. You can bring the price down to 200. I was very skeptical at that time. Blow me! Within three years, the price came down to 200. How did it fall? Uh, Merck's cost of production is 1,500. How did it come down to 200? It came down because competition produced a series of innovations and in processes. There was a huge amount of innovation involved in driving the price down from 1,500 to 200. It did not fall from heaven. The idea that there's no innovation or it's all copying is just crap. A huge amount of competition, a huge amount of innovation. It's an innovation in the processes. It is not, a, there are two kinds of innovation. One is the new product, one is the innovation. But the idea that somehow innovation just doesn't matter at all. The only thing that matters is the product. So excuse me. Let's be very clear, in almost any other product, suppose I had a monopoly of production for 20 years. I mean, I'd be at the top of the market, I'd be having everything. The idea that some new guy can suddenly come and beat the pants off me, it would be regarded as a joke. How does it happen? In only in drugs and in nothing else. And the reason it happens, I'm afraid, is that by giving a product patent, you produce a lazy, inefficient monopoly that has no interest in Process innovation that reduces costs. None. That's the problem. You know, what, what you're sitting on the high horse saying, my God, you know, I'm the top. Excuse me, this is a fat, lazy, inefficient monopoly. That's the only reason why this is the only industry in the world. Why I said a newcomer can come and beat the pants off an established guy. Uh, so I said, on this particular thing, we are, the Indian government is going to push uh, compulsory licensing is going to push price control as far as it can within WTO limits. So by all means, I think you know we need to go to the WTO and sort it out there. And the WTO will then lay down what, what the situation is. Mm. The current attitude within the United States and India, the Gulf is very, very far apart. This will have to be 
Mm. Once you get a WTO ruling, I think there will be some greater convergence of view on this particular mm. point. Okay, I've spent a long time on this. <laughs> uh, I don't know if there's time for any more. Uh, we can take it up later in the question answer. Okay, yeah. Let, let me, let me um, before we turn it to Derek, and I know you, we will probably have a lot of discussion just on the points that you just raised. Okay, you, well, you've yeah. kind of added some <laughs> excitement here. But, uh, but I mean, would you, could, <coughs> would you consider it, um, I mean, to the extent that IPR is some sort of monopoly, do you okay. also consider the physical plant of a company in India, also a monopoly. I mean, say Godridge has a plant producing, uh, you know, skincare products. Is it a monopoly on their own assets, or should they turn those assets at night over to another company to come in and produce all night long the same product? Is that unfair to have a monopoly on your own assets? No, it's a question of asset, what is property and what is rights? In the case of, if you would regard his uh, factory as a property, you are claiming that a product patent is... But it's a, but it's a monopoly on, that, on those assets. No, no, I'm sorry. He, only he it can is, use I, them no, legally, it, I'm right? Sorry, it is not a licensed monopoly for 20 years given by a government. Godridge owns it. That's actually property. This is the difference. But that's I mean, you're, you're, you're making and you're, you're suggesting that ownership of a factory, which is mine, mm -hmm. is the same as a temporary license given by a government, which, in fact, a patent examiner can, in fact, take a knock off tomorrow. But after, in both uh, cases, uh, you're after an appeal. <clears throat> but in both cases, you're protecting your investment in those assets. No, look, there are various kinds of ways you have of protect. Uh, of uh, I mean, if I have an invention, the question is, am I entitled to say the government will give me a monopoly? Through history, in most of production, you didn't get these things. Now, because when you because you didn't get them, innovation was inhibited. So various governments brought it in. They said it is appropriate to have a temporary monopoly to uh, help innovation. I mean, that's how the whole patent thing started, right? Having said that, it didn't apply. The notion of a product patent as distinct from process only came in the case of drugs. Mm. The only reason it came in the case of drugs was the argument that, look, it takes so much money to bring these things to market. That, you know, we can't do it in other things. In other cases, we only have a product. But here, let's, let, I mean, let, let, let me be able to patent the product itself. Well, some others would have said, you know, I, you can't patent a product. These things are in nature or these things are, you know, it's, it's, not, a, uh, it's, it's not a new invention. Mm -hmm. So in India, what they said was, if there is a process, by all means, patent it. But we won't agree to product patents. I mean, this was the Indian Patents Act of 1971, where we were very clear that we were getting to the high model ground. That's it. The, the notion, you know, while the, the existence of patents is agreed that this is an appropriate thing. In India, it's very clear that we have a big entertainment industry, we have a big music industry, we have a big software industry. I mean, is it the case that none of them thinks that, you know, uh, the temporary monopoly is bad? No. They all agree the temporary monopoly is okay. So it's not that India is against temporary monopoly is flat. Mm -hmm. The question of product, only on its own products. <laughs> the question of pro the question of the products. No, I said this this issue arose at a much earlier stage. I mean, there was a time when uh, the piracy of Indian films and music was rampant, completely rampant. Even though it was our own industry, nobody looked at it. Mm. That would be the case of China today. There's complete rampant piracy of Chinese music and Chinese. I mean, you only got, you aren't just in Hollywood. But even Chinese films and Chinese music, there's hardly any protection. You can go into any Chinese shop and pick up anything you like uh, at half a dollar. Uh, I mean, that's the kind of attitude they have. All I'm saying is that, you know, it, the, as, as far as we are concerned, IPR, the, as to what the moral ground is, we're very clear. It's, it's very different. This particular gulf is not going to disappear. Okay. Let me. Let me. Uh, I'm sorry to distract us there, but I, I, you provoked me. I couldn't help but uh, say something. Uh, let me turn it over to Derek. Derek's an Asian economist here at Heritage yes. Foundation, and uh, he may have some comments on this issue as well. Usually, I'm the boring one. Uh, no, that's not true. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> all right, let's start with the U.S. Um, I want to say this is a backdrop. Um, <coughs> the U.S. has been making Indian policy making more difficult for at least ten years with loose money. A lot of countries complain about American loose monetary policy, and it's not actually true. In the Indian case, it is true. And it doesn't mean that that means, okay, when Indians make stupid decisions, it's America's fault. It just means that as a backdrop to everything we talk about, when you're the reserve currency country and you flood the whole world with dollars, 
you make people's lives difficult, you kind of, you know, you need to walk into the room recognizing that you've done that. Of course, American negotiators don't want to do that because all of our loose money policy is directed toward domestic side and it is, you know, it's not aimed at anyone else and it affects everyone else. So I, I just want to say that at the beginning because I, I did a trip around Asia before I came to Heritage in 2005 and everyone was patting themselves on the back for how brilliant they were because they were all growing quickly. And I said, well, actually, this is just high global liquidity. You're not doing anything right. And then in 2008, when it every crash, it was all America's fault. Okay. I mean, there's a lot of hypocrisy, but nonetheless, U.S. monetary policy does frame a lot of these interactions. Most of trade is denominated in dollars. Dollars are becoming less worthwhile. That's an actual inhibitor to trade. So when we complain about these things, we should think about our own policies first. And I say that to start because I'm going to end up by attacking India's internal policies as well. Let's start with, uh, bi let's go into bilateral stuff. Um, the big issue on the U.S. side bilaterally is that we should not discriminate in, in labor movements. Uh, immigration reform is actually a huge issue, obviously, right now in the U.S. Uh, it's hardly reasonable to think of it in sort of how does immigration reform affect India because there's so many things going on in immigration reform for America, a lot of them negative. Uh, there are also pluses for India in immigration reform. But the main thing, I think, in terms of the relationship is the U.S. should not be deciding what's good foreign labor and what's bad foreign labor. This is labor supplied by other countries that we want on a market basis, and it's good. This is labor supplied by other countries that we want on a market basis, and it's bad. That should not be part of the immigration reform, uh, if there is one. Uh, and if it does, that is a harm to India. If we are going to start picking, essentially, winners and losers in foreign labor supply, that hurts our relationship with India. It would be responsible for the U.S. not to do that, if that's possible. Uh, on trade, I want to emphasize the states. Um, it's not the U.S. government's job to tell states what to do, but fortunately, uh, the Heritage Foundation is a national organization and not bound by the Constitution in terms of federalism, so I can tell states what to do. Uh, <laughs> some states solicit better U.S.-India relations and others <clears throat> don't. Uh, I think the, the ones that don't are making a mistake. There's a lot of posturing about outsourcing based on very little harm done to the states and a lot of potential in state-to-state -state relationships in U.S.-India that states are missing. And you can see a very broad range in U.S. state behavior, and it would improve uh, the relationship if more U.S. states thought a little bit instead of making political statements like Ohio concerning the, their interaction with India. Similarly, some companies are looking about thinking about the long term. They can be very critical of India in thinking about the long term. I don't have any problem with that. But the ones that are thinking in the short term and demanding better formal market access, I'll just say that two years from now they'll be coming back and complaining that India is not fulfilling its promises. You, if you're myopic and you're focused on market access in the short term, in, an, in a market where um, you know, household wealth is so low, you're just going to be unhappy. The whole idea is for India to succeed dramatically and for, for foreign companies to be able to share in that, not to get you know, promises made in negotiations. So I think there are some states that do a better job in encouraging better U.S.-India relationships and others do worse. There are some companies that do a better job in encouraging better U.S.-India relationships and others do worse. And I gave the reasons why. I mean, there's political posturing at the state level. There's short-term thinking. Too much emphasis on formal market access at the corporate level. I'm talking fast because I'm, as the last speaker, people are always ready for the speakers to shut up. So I'll try to go quickly. Um, India's side of the bilateral relationship, I, without taking a stand, which I'll do in a couple minutes on the, on the Linda and Walter versus Swami debate, um, if you want to stand out among Indian states and companies, Enforce IPR laws better by the U.S. standard, by the global standard, by the EU standard. It's not, you don't have to. It's a choice. But it would make, it would make the states or firms stand out a lot, and it would be a massive uh, boost to uh, reputation effects among multinationals. So, I mean, one of the responses that sort of lame compromise I would have is let Indian states and companies decide their behavior and deal with the states and companies that you like. Uh, and that's one of the advantages of the approach that both Heritage and, and Cato uh, have suggested, which is if everything has to be settled at the national level, it's going to be very hard to, to bridge this gap. If things can be settled below the national level, then we can have a booming part of the U.S., part of India economic relationship. And that's better than what we have now. And maybe that's all that we can have at the, at the current time. It certainly would be an improvement rather than bashing our heads against the same wall again and again and again. Uh, similarly in trade, Indian states can control their own trade and investments environment to some extent. Um, partly by setting their own policies and partly by setting policies that offset national policies if they don't like them. They can't control everything. 
but they can control to some extent, and they're big enough to constitute separate markets. So what I would say to Indian states is don't hide behind <coughs> national policy. Think about what you want your own trade policy to be. A um, lot, of, lot of flexibility there with some creative thinking about, about uh, trade policy. Um, and I would say that some Indian states and, and smaller companies, not so much the ones operating here, need better information about what multinationals can offer in terms of capital, of course, but also in terms of technology. And by technology, I don't just mean advanced technology. I mean the practices, organizational practices, environmental remediation being one of them, water saving and all sorts of production processes. Um, multinationals are not just about let's have a big land dispute and promise $2 billion and you know, start try to pay people off for their land. They have a lot of things they can offer, and I, I think there would be value in somebody providing information at the local level in India about the various things that, 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 that international firms can offer, and not just the big ones, not just the, not just the giants. Um, and there are, some, there are a couple of states that have these kind of agencies uh, that, 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 that do this kind of development work, but only a couple of them, I think, in my experience anyway, do it very well. So that's some encouragement to the U.S. and India for, for things they want to do, which was the point of the paper that we released in January. I want to focus be partly because of this debate, partly because internal changes in large economies are always more important than, than external changes. Um, and I'll, I'll try to take my version of, of reconciling the debate here, which will probably just irritate both sides. Um, I, I don't, on property rights, you know, I don't see how multinationals can expect secure property rights in India when poor Indians don't have secure property rights to their land. Um, I mean, I, I'd love to have a debate over that. I had one last time, well, not the last time I was in India, the time before that. Um, you know, if you don't, the most basic thing in development, no country has ever successfully developed with contested rights to, you know, seemingly every piece of rural land uh, that there is. So, you know, when that's the backdrop, Asking for IPR protection is, you know, you're way ahead of the game here. India's got much more work to do on property rights than that. And, you know, in the, in the direct debate, because um, I do think IPR has to be a secondary issue on the, on the right side because rural prop land property rights are so much more important, you know, India's property rights haven't gotten worse, but U.S. yelling about them has gotten worse, and I don't, I don't really understand why. Uh, on the other hand, Swami's defense, you know, I think Swami contradicted himself because he made the point that, look, this is a, this is a, ownership versus competition. If you have too much emphasis on ownership, you have not enough competition. Fine, but he starts off with, and, 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 and good India observers all start off with, the same point. There's not a, a commitment to liberal economics in India, which is not a commitment to property rights. So in that context, it's very easy for the U.S. to be suspicious about what's going on here. Oh, suddenly India's gotten very high-minded about competition. But I have all these examples where India is not as high-minded about competition. Why is it high-minded about competition in this case? So in both cases, I think there's, there's some inconsistency in the positions. My own view, having you know, attacked both of my colleagues on the panel, is that uh, intellectual property rights I understand why the U.S. gets so upset. It's our comparative advantage in innovation. In my opinion, India needs to work on something much more basic <coughs> first. Uh, foreign firms complained bitterly about predatory tax behavior recently by the Indian government. I agree with that complaint. But let's recall, India has been waiting on GST, unification of its own tax system, for, how, for years and years and years. So when you can't actually, India doesn't, is not actually a unified tax system. The states apply vastly different taxes, and not that, not that GST, as it turns out, will solve all these problems. But when India can't even take a step to dealing with its own, you know, reforming its own tax system, again, you're not going to expect that multinationals are going to get great treatment. Uh, lastly, Indian manufacturing isn't open, uh, isn't open to the outside. I, I agree with that local content requirements. I agree with that too. But it's not really open to Indian firms either. Formal sector manufacturing, because of labor law requirements, is basically has constituted a huge barrier to entry. So why am I doing this? Why am I you know, taking the multinational criticism and rejecting it? Because to me, you need to have a long-term view in India, and I know everyone always says that, but in the, I have specifics here. India has to make progress on internal <coughs> reform. That's what's going to deliver the goods for foreigners and Indians as well. And when India is swinging and missing, which I think both of my colleagues agree with, on internal reform, you're not going to get a lot of progress in the relationship. And the real, the real harm here is not that multinationals have been suddenly wronged in the last couple of years. The real harm here, and I would actually go that before 2008, I think the process of moving forward in reform started before then. The process moving backwards starts in 2008. Um, reform stuff. Forward momentum stops about 2003 or four, and then we go backward after that. India's got to get its act together, and 
uh, that's the real, the real issue here. If India gets its act together, and, and the U.S. needs to as well on monetary policy, if India gets its act together, I think this seemingly unbridgeable gap goes away to a large extent. If India doesn't get its act together, all the concessions that, that, uh, that the U.S. is pressing for now are going to turn out to be nothing, and we'll be back here in three years saying, you know, they said they were going to do this, and they didn't. And that's my, my happy closing thought of the day. <laughs> Yeah, the, um, actually, you surprised me with your note of reconciliation. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> but in fact, I mean, you know, there, there are some pretty contentious issues here, but the whole route through the states is a way of getting past some of the more difficult ones. And, and we don't even know the full extent, actually, the full potential that's, that, that's there. I wanted to uh, just ask, Linda, if you had anything you wanted to say before we open up to questions. Sanjay, same. You know, the, the long debate and uh, comments you made rejecting intellectual property, intellectual property provisions that India did agree to, however that came to be as part of TRIPS. I, you know, we could have a legal argument. I started my career as a, uh, as a lawyer doing international trade about, you know, whether what we've seen in India is, is anything that has ever been contemplated under the TRIPS agreement and, and, and all of that. And we could have, you know, many discussions about the other areas outside pharmaceuticals where India has taken the opposite reaction when it comes to energy, climate, um, in many other ways uh, against innovation. But rather than having that debate, I think from the perspective of an organization <clears throat> that believes in manufacturing and believes in the add-on effect that manufacturing has for entire economies, um, the biggest multiplier effect of any part of the U.S. economy is manufacturing. And the importance of that for all parts of society, from the health of our citizens, our connectivity, our education, energy, many of the things you talked about, we believe fundamentally, and this is where perhaps there's, 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 no, there's no room for debate, if you want to grow a manufacturing economy, something India desperately wants to do and has not succeeded in doing, you've got to respect property. You know, I, I, I'm, I'm not in a position to comment on uh, Indian property law, but yes, all types of property, including intellectual property, you have to have a market-driven economy that doesn't force Capital is a coward. We all know it. India wants foreign investment. We want foreign investment in the United States. Foreign investment, based on the UNCTAD report that came out, I think, Wednesday, has been declining substantially. Everybody is in a race for very few dollars. If you want to grow your economy, there are ways to grow an economy and then a manufacturing ecosystem, um, and, then, and there are ways to stymie that. And, you know, I, I stand where I stood before, which is innovation, property, um, and policies that are market-driven and not the sort of state-favoring industrial policies. Um, let let the market run. Sanjay, do you want to add anything? Um, no, I mean, I was uh, uh, enjoying the debate, and especially she was bottling up her thoughts when <laughs> Swami was speaking. Uh, but one thing that is interesting is in this pharmaceutical debate is American companies are buying left, right, and center, all the pharma Indian generic pharmaceutical companies for billions of dollars. So uh, I don't know how that kind of is going to play out in this intellectual property debate, because I have a feeling all the large ones are either gone or will be gone very shortly by American uh, or European manufacturers. So. All right, let's open it up to questions. Yeah, very back. It, uh, it seems to me in this discussion that uh, part of India's primary problem is that it's just simply not committed to, to liberal economics. It's not committed to the protection of law. It seems to me that that's kind of the underlying theme of this discussion, that it's in so much trouble because it's tried to <clears throat> develop its economy in a, in a centralized fashion. I guess my question for the panelists is three parts. You know, first, why did India, you know, embark on this path of socialism when it gained independence? Uh, why do uh, voters in this democratic country uh, keep returning politicians that espouse these policies that don't work? And do you think that there's any possibility that the Indian people uh, might reject these policies and might, I, might become more ideologically committed to, uh, to free market policies? Thank you. Uh, Swami, why don't you take that? 
a free market does not arise on its own by disappearance of government. Disappearance of government results in chaos. So before capitalism can take out, you need a government that does some basic things. Uh, property rights, security, uh, laws being done. Right? All these basic things need to be done first. They have not been done in India. I mean, I think Derek put his finger on it. When you talk about, you know, on many of these rights, do they exist for Indians? They don't. So out there, we are still at the point where the government is not fulfilling, I would say, 60% of its basic functions. Therefore, the demand broadly is for the government. Why are you not fulfilling those functions? That is seen as we need more government. The American notion of how do we get less government? I mean, when the government is doing all the functions that the government is supposed to do, and then some more, then we can get to the position of saying maybe the government is doing too much. So at the election time, what are the issues? Somebody will say, you know, there is uh, I, I, there's discrimination against me because it is so. You give me a quota for my my industry, my particular caste. You give a quota for my particular race. You haven't uh, you claimed that you're going to give me electricity. I get electricity not at all of a half an hour a day. This road has collapsed five years ago. You haven't rebuilt the road. I mean, the, again and again, the, the worst is the justice system. The, any kind number of applications, you say, I applied for a remission for a change in the land records and uh, I find somebody has stolen my land. Or somebody else will say, you know, I'm going to register this and for each thing I'm being asked to write. So the, the real problem faced by the Indian public is that the government is not doing basic government functions. And therefore the entire electoral politics is to how the government should do more for the people. The debate of market versus non-market has not taken place in India at the electoral level and will not take place until we have solved these internal problems. So that is the broad picture. So, you know, uh, as I said, I have a different view on the patents. On most of the other things, I would entirely agree with what Linda is saying and with what Derek has said. There is an Indian slide back, which is not good for India. But as Derek says, this is equally affecting Indian industry. You have more and more Indians saying it is disgusting. I can't get anything damn through. I'm going to get out of India and I'm going to invest in Africa and Australia. I mean, we have the third largest coal reserves in the world. We're importing huge amounts. Indian companies are going to Australia and putting up $10 billion plants. I mean, you know, Linda said, you know, there's a small amount of foreign investment. Indians say, forget it. I am the foreign investor investing <laughs> yeah. in Australia. No, you see that. It's the other way around. So the, the climate, the investment climate overall in India has slid back very seriously. So that will have to be changed entirely for the purposes of Indians themselves. There will be no particular paying attention to the specific problems of foreigners because it is a subset of a much larger issue. Uh, one point, uh, you talked about why don't Indians elect leaders. You know, I'm, one of the uh, political leaders I'd met some time back made a statement, I don't know if Swami agrees with this or not. He says, you know, like the United States people say is a right of center country to a large extent. They say India is a left of center country to most extent. And I don't know, that was, he, he's one of the most uh, respected speakers. I don't know if Swami agrees with that or not. No, it's left of, it's, the way that left, left and right is defined very is different. Right? Uh, very left. But to the extent that we talk about, do you want more government? Everybody in India wants more government because the government is not fulfilling its basic functions. The most elementary functions are not being done. There's no justice. There is no law, there is no security. I mean, the basics are not there. There is a huge demand for more government. I mean, the, we are, some, the, the norm for judges, for instance, is 50 per million or something. India has seven or eight or nine, and half those positions are not filled, and they go on vacation half the time, and no, no decision is given for less than 100 years or so. The Babri Masjid case is more than 100 years old. You know, the... the Basic functions of government are not being performed. So the hugest mm -hmm. demand is for more and more from the government. Yeah, I think the um, the point you made earlier about there being no ideological liberals in India is, uh, you know, w we come at it from a less experienced perspective than you do, and I can attest to that. I mean, mm -hmm. having uh, searched high and low for some uh, <laughs> some co-authors to this report that we did, uh, it, <laughs> it, is really, it is really hard out there to find people. And, and I, you know, I think that's the basis you have to develop first. There have to be some intellectual capacity developed, too. I mean, not so much ca capacity, but perspective on some of these things before you develop some political parties that are committed to them. Um, other questions? Yes, sir, right here. 
You've got a microphone. Please identify yourself if you wouldn't mind. Yeah, actually, my question is to Linda. You know, she's could, protecting. Could you identify the, yourself? Sorry. Okay, my name is uh, Alok Shirvastwa. Uh, I work for a defense company. I'm a technical fellow, but I'm here as a personal citizen. You know, not from my company. Okay. And uh, I did my PhD from Indian Institute of Technology, IIT Delhi. So I'm very much in high tech. My question is to Linda. Uh, you protected the. Uh, American manufacturers, and I fully agree with you, you know, but do you think that American manufacturers, they have a double standards? Uh, let's see the example of uh, BP, British Petroleum in Louisiana, you know, there was an oil leak over there, they took care of everything, you know, very well taken care, still paying for that, you know. But see the Union Carbide in India, you know, many years back, 100,000 people become blind, hundreds of people died, you know. What about the American manufacturing over there? That brings the bitterness, you know, over there. You know, Union Carbide still have not done anything paid to the uh, victims over there, you know. So what's your comment on that? I don't have a specific answer on that case. Um, let me tell you what I typically see when I see our companies going overseas when they foreign in, when they invest. They bring their technology, although more and more I hear companies that aren't interested in going to India because with high technology, and, and you see that in, in the healthcare, but you see that across the board uh, in India because it's not just a pharmaceutical patent issue. It's an industrial policy against innovation. But they bring their technology, they bring their skill sets, and they bring a sense of building a community. Almost every company I have visited in overseas markets where you know, it's a developing country and there isn't the clean water. Oftentimes the manufacturing processes require cleaner water than is available. And so they set up that wastewater treatment facility. They do other things in their community. I've, you know, I've, I've seen it across the world. I don't know the specifics. I, you know, I, I've, I've certainly heard the history. I don't know the specifics of that case. Um, I think you know, when a company goes overseas, and this is one of the reasons we've long supported bilateral investment treaties, a company is subjecting itself entirely to the laws of that other country, right? So BP comes to the United States, they're subject to U.S. law. A company goes to any overseas market, they are subject fully to that, that country's laws, which may be applied fairly or maybe applied indiscriminately or in, in a bad fashion. And that's why something like a bilateral investment treaty, which I think would help on basic rule of law and <coughs> property, but it's just not, it's not clear to a lot of us at this point whether India has any interest in doing that, helps regularize that and helps provide an objective uh, forum to resolve disputes. So let me, let me say something about this, because I think we've seen in the last year <clears throat> something that reflects a little bit on this issue. First of all, the Union Carbide human toll is so big that it kind of swamps everything else. And for people who are involved in that, you know, the discussion you and I can have here just doesn't matter. Um, <clears throat> however, the thing about this is, you know, this was a long time ago. There was very little binding uh, agreements between the U.S. and India at the time on how to settle this. Union Carbide paid the biggest price a company can pay. Again, you know, humans and companies are totally different. It died. It died as a company. Um, the way you would then, when a company goes bankrupt, if BP had not been able to meet its liabilities, if it had been a smaller, weaker company than it was, there would have been settlement between U.S. and Britain using the court system. Well, the U.S. and India didn't have any in, in this kind of connection. I don't know what they would do now. I'll give you an example. Uh, India has made an internal, this is totally different than Union Carbide. Union Carbide is up here, but this is an illustration of, the, of how difficult this is even now with all the progress that we've made. India has made an internal decision to reverse the, the results of the 2G auction. Well, the reason India is revising its, its own bilateral investment agreement protocol is because a bunch of companies have sued under the terms of the bilateral investment agreement they signed to say, you can't do that to us. So this is still a contested issue at a much lower level. I mean, they're not talking about thousands of people dying. They're just talking about billions of dollars. At a much lower level, we still don't have the solution on, on, on what to do here, and India doesn't have it either. So, I mean, you know, there's always going to be an issue with foreign investment. There's, it's always, there's always going to be a, the executive ran to the airport and got away, and there are assets overseas we can't get to. If you want to focus on that, you have a problem. What, this is why I made the point before, and, and the person who wrote this section in the paper is Lavish Bhandari, not me. 
um, talking about how Indians see the negative of the foreign investment. They don't see how foreign investors, for example, who are you know disciplined overseas by by home country governments, by stock markets, actually in general mostly are more responsible than local governments because they feel not all the time and not everywhere they feel more they feel more public relations pressure so again this is this esoteric argument or discussion you and I are having I don't mean to say that it stands up to union carbide but even now we see that it's not easy to manage these relationships and that if you want to focus on that and lose all the benefits of foreign investment and that applies to foreign investment coming into this country as well then probably you're going to deny yourself a lot of knowledge that can improve people's lives. You know, just to add, the situation is even worse than what Derek's about. I really it like is. him. <laughs> <laughs> I'm usually the most negative person in the room. No, no. <laughs> What's happened is that because we have an administration which basically has not been implementing its own laws or various norms, the Supreme Court has started taking on all kinds of public interest suits from anybody who feels like. And we in the media cheered them on. So every judge is dying to overturn each and every executive decision today. You have a situation, therefore, where, you know, in some other country you might say, well, we will weigh the negatives and positives of foreign investment. But the NGO activist is not concerned with the positives, only concerned with the negative. But the, there was a time when, you know, maybe in the ministry you would consider both sides. But now the NGO can go straight to the courts. The courts can then issue a stay stopping this and then reverse the whole thing. The 2G spectrum was reversed ultimately by a court decision, which to my mind was scandalously bad. But uh, I mean, the courts are the courts. So we have a situation where it is not just the government that is a problem. The system of public interest suits, which has arisen, enables various activist groups to hobble all the executive decisions, and in some cases, to reverse them. But, you know, uh, there are American investments which are viewed pretty well, too. I mean, maybe they're not manufacturing. Just go down to Bangalore or Pune or stuff like that and walk down and see Google and Oracle. And I think they're employing thousands of Indians' infrastructure. The real estate boom in India is kind of fed by American investment of outsourcing because the homes that are coming up, the malls that are coming up. So their families are being fed. So I think that's a positive. I, I agree. I go India everywhere, and I mm -hmm. very much familiar with what you think. I was just trying to say on manufacturing, you know, on moral grounds and those things, just comparing BP and, you know, American expect same thing over here, that kind of quality and those things, you know, when they go to other developing countries, although I'm American too, you know, I feel embarrassed when their people ask this question in India when I'm, I'm there, you know, but they conduct business over there. You don't follow those kind of ethnic standards which they expect other mm -hmm. companies to do over here. And as a follow-up question, sir, about your uh, 2G and all that, you know, it's, it's embarrassing, but this morning when I was coming on national radio, I was listening, you know, that Mr. Snowdown is in, in Russia in that airport, you know, he leaks many things. And one of the things he disclosed is that we talked about proprietary rights, you know, copyrights and those things, that the U.S. intelligence was spying on the China on their 4G technology, which is a Chinese technology, you know, and they gave that technology to Cisco and to the Juniper systems over here, you know. Yeah. So what do you want to comment on that? You know? Well, I'll take this briefly. I've been following Chinese telecom for 20 years, and Edward Snowden is an idiot. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Simple. I, I mean, we can have a debate. Or I can't, I'm not qualified to have a debate over U.S. cyber behavior. But on telecom, I am. And I stand by my description of him. <laughs> All right, let's uh, thank you. Right there. In the back. I'll come back to you. Yeah. Uh, I'm Dr. P from Beijing Nations, and since China's name came up in the last comment, could the panel compare on all these important topics, how does at least two other BRICS countries compare to India, let's say China and Russia or China and Brazil, because it will be very useful and knowledge for us to know how you all think about those two. Um, anyone? Well, I can. I, I mean, I can do this to some extent. I certainly know a lot about China. Um, you know, the the Chinese have. Th this is a strange thing to talk about with China versus India because one's an authoritarian country and one's a democratic country. But the Chinese have. I didn't say more extensive. I said clearer property rights to land than the Indians do. 
It's not that they're more extensive. It's not that they treat their rural people. I'm not I'm making that argument. I mean, the, the, the situation with rural property is clearer in China, which is why China had an explosion in agricultural productivity in the 80s that wasn't based on technology. It was based on rights, which led to the, manuf the, 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 the migrant workers moving to special economic zones, which led to the trade expansion and so on. The second part of that is Chinese labor markets now, this is just strange because they're segmented by region due to registration, but within those regions, they are much more open than Indian labor markets. So when you operate in a specific region, if you have enough labor pool right there, you can do whatever you want. You, have a, you are much more efficient in terms of labor as a manufacturer within that area than you, are, than you can be in Indian manufacturing. So if, you, if India wanted to follow the China model, which I'm not suggesting that it did, the conditions are not in place for that. The, 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 the contested state of land rights and the inability to freely hire and fire in formal sector manufacturing don't match the Chinese model. There are advantages and disadvantages of the Chinese model. I'm not saying that's the only path. There's a clear difference between India and China. Another one, is, as um, Nobel laureate Sen pointed out last week in the Times, is uh, effective literacy, the extent of education at the primary and secondary level, which is crucial in, in you know, a, a high, high, high quality manufacturing labor force. So those would be the main things I would point out between India and China. I don't know enough about Brazil or Russia to talk about those countries. Right, gentlemen, the plaid tie right here. A uh, question for Mr. I.R. Um, without trying to sound triumphalist, the United States isn't the oldest nation in the world. It's not the most populous. And while we're blessed um, with resources, we're not necessarily the most blessed in the world. Um, but we believe in an intellectual property system here, not only because we think it's fair to reward people for those sorts of investments, but it also incentivizes mm -hmm. for competition and inventiveness and the things that uh, we talked about. Do you... As a result of that, we are the most prosperous and innovative and competitive nation in human history. First part of the question is, would you ascribe that to coincidence? And secondly, do you think it's fair for groups in India or any other place to just be able to take and piggyback off of enormous investments of money and time that go into these things that are afterwards seen as communitarian property? I mean, the broader question, there are many, many things that uh, America had did right. Uh, the patenting part is, a, is to some extent important. The Jeffersonian thing that, uh, that came in at the very beginning, the fact that you can get something back on your thing. Please understand that in the United States, too, there were no product patents for drugs for years and years and years. You know, it, you have to get to, for processes, yes. I mean, India always had process patents for drugs. After 2005, when India formally came into the WTO system, India has given more than 4,000 patents for various pharmaceutical <coughs> things. Most of them are processed. Uh, I think the number of product patents, somebody told me, is getting on to 90 to 100, whatever. But it's not as though this is not being done. I mean, the way it's being put, India doesn't do anything. India has, sorry. Mm. India has a high bar. Right? Under the WTO rules, every country sets up its own thing. The, there was a famous Gleevec case which came up a few months ago in India, that Novartis had this drug called Gleevec, which it had patented all over the place. Uh, it couldn't get a patent in India. I mean, it was a 1993 drug, uh, a, a period when product patent wasn't there. But it came up with a new version of Gleevec and said, this new Gleevec is more efficacious. You give me a patent for new Gleevec. And it was considered at various levels. And the Supreme Court said, when we look into it, was this sufficiently innovative or was it what we call evergreening? That there was an important basic innovation, but after that, the small marginal things on top of it, that is not a sufficiently innovative step for us to give a patent. So there was a high standard of patent applied by the Indian Supreme It was not a government decision. It was a court decision. And they said, we are going to have a high standard because you know this is a monopoly. We will give it. Many, many patents have been given, but there is a particular standard being applied. And in this particular case, it's a new Gleevec. Is it that much better than old Gleevec? And I said, in our view, it's not that much better, that it deserves a 20-year license. So, you know, it's not the case. I mean, it's entirely, the, I, I mean, I would agree that the Jeffersonian bringing in of the patents in America was an important part that helped American industrialization. It's not the whole story by any means. 
you know, you have to kill all the Indians and grab the land. I mean, there's, there's, there's a whole lot of other stuff that went with it. Uh, <laughs> sorry? Okay. Okay. All right. All right. <laughs> could I? Could no. I? Could, could I make a point? Yeah. You know the Gleevec case. Yeah. I'm sorry. Yeah. India is an absolute outlier. There are about a hundred other con countries that have seen that the new version is an innovative, different product that provides this pharmaceutical product. So it is more efficacious. So it actually works to improve the health of patients. It is, yes, a court decision in a country that itself is bound by international rules. But I, I go back, I, I mean, I think you made an excellent point. Look at the innovation in the United States economy, the information and communications technology world. Look at it in, obviously, biotech, pharmaceuticals. Look at it across manufacturing. And... A lot of it, we believe, is due to creating an innovation ecosystem that starts with the protection of property. We have lots of competition in the U.S. market, um, and that's the way we think we can succeed. You know, we're going to agree to disagree about patents for, forevermore, yeah. but, um, you know, I got to say, I, I, I hear these stories and I hear these one-offs about, oh, well, th this many patents have been approved. You know, in, in the last 18 months or so, you know, about nine of the 45 innovative pharmaceutical products that have been patented in India have been under assault. Yeah, there's lots of patents out there that have been granted on, you know, part of the research stage and all of that. I'm not a chemist like my father, so I don't understand exactly where, where all that comes. But in terms of, of products that are innovative, that are helping solve communities' problems, you know, we're looking at, you know, a huge number that are under assault and are being then produced by Indian companies that are charging patients lots of money, you know, thousands of dollars yeah. for those products. It's not about health. This is about industrial policy. I would say a manufacturing and jobs crop. Right here. Hi, um, Tani Fukui from U.S. International Trade Commission. Um, now, I think there's a little bit of agreement um, about the fact that there has been re recent retrenchment of the liberalization policies, I believe, but I believe there's been a, there was a little bit of difference um, in terms of the timeline across um, uh, the three of the three of you on the right. Um, I think uh, Derek said three, 2003, 2004 is when the retrenchment happened. So Swami said progress stopped. Okay, that's okay. different. We stopped okay. moving forward. Yeah. And um, and I think Swami linked it to the 2008 financial crisis, and I believe, Linda, you discussed it, but last 18 months or so. If you, the uptick has been right, huge if, in the last right, 18 months. Right. If you can discuss a little bit, you know, l the way Swami did linking it to perhaps some motivation um, from the Indian side, if, if you have any, if you have any... Okay, well, I mean, about. I have a very simple timeline, which is, and this happens everywhere, um, <laughs> You have governments that are willing to take, this has nothing to do with India, it's happening in the U.S., it's happened all over the world. You have governments that, are, that feel bound or motivated to take reforms. They take the reforms and then the ensuing government has a decision to try to continue to make difficult decisions or to live off the gains of the reform. So we had a second wave of Indian, we had a first wave of Indian reform, as Swami referred to, and then we had a second wave of Indian reform. And then after the second wave of Indian reform, we had, we've, we've had kind of coasting. We don't need to do anymore, which is kind of an odd conclusion to draw given the level of, of, uh, of average household wealth in India in you know, 2003 or 2004 or whatever year uh, exactly is the right year for this. And then I agree with Swami that the second thing that happens is this, you know, the, we're, we were insulated from the financial shock because we've had an inefficient financial system for the entire, entirety of our history. So hooray, let's celebrate the inefficient financial system and let's extend that logic everywhere else. So that, my timeline is that I don't necessarily see what Linda sees uh, more intense backsliding in the last 18 months. I understand her concerns. I don't think her concerns are wrong. I just think that the changes were circa 2003, stop moving forward because you've done some reforms and now everything's going to be fine. And then at 2008, Walter knows this very well, I, I did a tour of India in 2009 talking about how India could maintain uh, you know, positive momentum. And I kept hearing it was India's turn. 
It was now India's turn to rise. I'm like, you don't take turns. You have to have policies. But that wasn't the sentiment. It was just, it was our turn. And we don't need to do anything. Magic will happen. Um, so I think the, you know, that, that's, that sounds like a stupid explanation. But in fact, you see this again and again and again. After governments are willing to take some hard reform steps, they get political fatigue. And they don't want to do it anymore. And then this is the, the kind of result that you have. I would say that, you know, I'm surprised about this last 18 months because I would say ever since Manmohan Singh and Chidambaram changed the thing last September, I would have said that the business climate improved distinctly. And there was a huge move, certainly on the part of government, to try and say, look, you know, you know we really want to make things better, especially for foreign investment. Uh, till then, things were certainly going downhill. Mm. Uh, but after that particular point, I mean, they risked the life of the government itself on the issue of FDI and retail. Now, the kind of conditions attached were so onerous that it hasn't fructified. But nevertheless, the government risked its entire life on trying to say, let's have more foreign investment in retail. It then followed up in various, uh, I mean, there are various other it's and bitsy things. The new bank licenses are coming. Uh, foreign banks were allowed to convert branches into subsidiaries without uh, getting it. So, you know, there were, uh, on a number of areas, you saw the government attempting to become more friendly. Uh, so I really would like to know, I mean, I mean, my impression was that while things had gone bad in the last nine months, my impression was that things had gotten better. Uh, what has gone wrong in, in, in that period? So PMA. Uh, the that that well, but the, the, the movement forward on it has accelerated, and, and even within the last week, we've seen, last two weeks, I guess, on the telecommunications side, extending it to, to private companies. Uh, you know, one of my colleagues from the information technology industry had, you know, a, a news article yesterday about moving forward on advancing this policy well beyond government procurement, where governments clearly have restrictions, although... Um, you know, one can one can look at the you know the good and the bad of, of of doing some of this, especially these onerous local content. Take a look at the solar industry and 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 those types of actions. And they started a little bit before, but they're getting worse. And and now there's new reports that you know a whole new host of solar film technology, thin film technology, uh, is on the the proverbial <coughs> cutting block. Um, we've seen it in a lot of areas. And I will say, look, I'm not an India scholar by any stretch of the imagination. What we are responding to at the National Association of Manufacturers, why, you know, I've testified about this, why we fo formed the, the AFTI uh, with colleagues across U.S. business sectors, right? This isn't just NAM. There's a whole host of, of different industry associations that, that care about this. Is this is what we're hearing from our companies? Our companies who have been trying to do business in India, who have wanted to have that type of stronger commercial relationship and feel that the, the path has gone backwards and that, you know, even attempts at dialogue get stymied. And so we've reached a point where, you know, what makes sense? What do, what do our businesses want to do? Do we want to continue investing in India? Um, and, and there's a lot of uh, questions about that in, in, in companies around the country. Um, but what we want most of all, and what we've asked our government for, and, and we'll be talking, of course, with, with uh, the Indian government, is to find a better way forward. I hope Derek's not right that none of these reforms can take place till we have all of these broader reforms. Because I would say that, you know, many of us understand the power of foreign investment. We see it, I te I've testified in our own Congress about the value of foreign investment into the U.S. market. It is valuable. It can create jobs. It can spur economic growth. It can help lift all boats. Um, but if you don't have that foreign investment or that foreign investment has dried up and India has declined substantially between 2011 and 2012, according to the latest UNCTAD report and reports for the first, you know, part of this year are that it's, it's significantly declining. Um, but that, that's a key way to, to improve um, if, India, if India chooses that. And it's up to India at this point. Just one point I would add is, look at the political structure of India. It's 
coalition politics, I think it's going to be the flavor for the future. So what happens is, he talked about the FDI, etc. The coalition partners are always trying to out-protectionize one another. So whether it's the Samajwadi party, it's uh, Mamta who left because of the retail stuff. So basically, the party, so to speak, the Congress party in power is hijacked on every policy issue. And this is not to make excuses for the government, but there is a paralysis that is happening. And it's they are being forced to retrench every policy decision. You talked about, you know, that Chidambaram took over from Pranab Mukherjee, etc. But every policy that they make, because now they have to rely on uh, Samajwadi, or they have to rely behind the scenes on Mayawati. They have elections coming up. They want to act more socialist or left of the center than anybody else. But this is how it's going to be for the future. India is going to have coalition politics. It's never going to change, at least for the next 20 years, From if you look at the demographics and stuff like that. And that's a reality that American businesses also need to keep in mind. I have to completely disagree. <laughs> <laughs> the coalition Good. era is when Indian liberalization has taken place. And these unstable governments, this is precisely the area when all the reform has taken place. I mean, you, you, you seem that the, when Congress was rock solid, the complete socialism, there was, there was no question of looking out at all. Uh, your, the last few months, the Congress lost its majority, and you've seen more reform. And I mean, how far these attempts go, I don't know. But, but uh, when you say, you know, you have to give in and you have to give in, the Congress didn't have to give in to any of these people. It plays them off against one another. That's politics. But they don't it have is, many it, left to play. They only have Samajwadi I'm, Party to play I'm, versus Mayawati. Who else is left? I'm sorry. Nobody wants to trouble the government. You may not have noticed. You, if you, I mean, if you really, I mean, if, if the opposition really wanted to talk, mm -hmm. trouble the government on the finance bill, they would have moved. No, no government. They didn't bother. The, but on your, the big issues... No, no, look, I simply said this, mm -hmm. as an observer of the scene, mm -hmm. the mere fact that you have a coalition does not mean that you go communist or you go socialist. So the coalition politics has very much gone with economic liberalization. So you must not confuse those two. Uh, India is going to get into even more messy coalitions probably after the 2014 election. The idea that that means that in itself, it is anti-multinational or foreign doesn't follow. In fact, I, you know what of, very of, often happens in a really messy coalition uh, of the kind we had in 96-98, when you have a, a number of regional parties getting together, they don't, they don't even have a problem. You get a prime minister who's extremely weak, and he can't discipline anybody because the cabinet is basically a negotiated entity it's, and not appointed. Like it's not appointed right by him. It's very but, similar to what we have now. But in 1996 to mm -hmm. 1998, India did okay. India has been through an era of a minority government of complete patchwork of very, very minor parties, a joke of a prime minister, or two, 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 two jokes of prime ministers. I mean, we had the famous Deva Gowda, who was prime minister for a short time, and he went down to Singapore and shook hands and assured the Singapore government that the Tata Singapore Airlines deal would go through. He came, I mean, Singaporeans thought it was done, <laughs> then they discovered nothing is done. Civil Aviation Minister says, no, this is what kind of country is this? Can I over who the Prime Minister? He said, yes. <laughs> and he said, I mean, is he a communist? He said, no, he's, he's, he's there not his whole party, Mr. Ibrahim. You can't even discipline him. So, you know, in a thing when you had the messy coalition, things got done. The rate of growth between 1996 and 98, we had 7.5% growth. We faced the Asian financial crisis, we overcame it. Things did not collapse. So I said, you know, I think you're unless uh, just this limited thing to have coalitions and unstable coalitions has been the very same era when we've had maximum reform and fastest growth. Mm -hmm. So don't confuse the political instability with the other problems. I okay. will disagree, but we'll leave okay. it at that. Okay. I disagree too. Mm -hmm. Okay. I'm giving you the fact, the track record I'm giving you. Right here, the yellow tie there. Hi, my name is John Stamford. I'm with Madison Services Group. We do mainly small business advocacy for national organizations. Um, thank you for being here, particularly thank you for putting Linda next to Swami for the audience's <laughs> entertainment. Um, my question is mainly to Derek, um, but others can win as they feel. Um, I think the direct quote is that from you is that India's got to get its act together. Um, and I think you elucidated well how they need to do that. My question to you is, for people like Linda and other people giving advice to people, 
both large and small companies considering foreign investment in India. Is it worth it to go into India now while they're getting their act together and have to live with things like the Novartis decision like in, in a pharmaceutical case, but other places where there are going to be deterioration of IP from time to time? Or is it better to let them try and get their act together without the benefits of foreign investment and then come back and hopefully live in a system where major pharma, major corporations don't have to face such a struggle? All right, I'm gonna give you, I was 10 years in the private sector doing exactly this, answering this question. Um, I'll give you the boring generic answer and then I'll make Walter happy and give you a, a better answer. The generic answer is obviously it's sector dependent. It's not just sector dependent because how, how India treats companies by sector varies by sector, but it's also sector dependent on how fast you can establish yourself in a new market. So, you know, do you need to establish brand loyalty? Are you not in that part of the supply chain? And so you can, you can quickly uh, get established because you're going to complement local producers. So obviously you need to look at your own business. But now here's the part that will make Walter happy. Don't think of India as a national market. So the answer to the question is you're not going into India. You're going into Karnataka. You're going into Tamil Nadu. Is that market, is the market in the state that you're going into, and we're getting, we're getting back to our point about state-to-state -state relationships, company-to-state relationship, and so on, is that good for you? If you start evaluating India, well, you're not operating in India, and you're operating in a certain place. Is that state good enough? That's how I would make decisions. I would break the decisions up. I would look away from the national level and what, you know, what they're doing, you know, what the Supreme Court's deciding on pharma and so on, and, and decide whether the, the Indian state or even the metropolis, if it's big enough and depending on your goals, you're representing small companies, you just need to deal with one Indian company. Can you work with that company in the state that it's operating in? So that, that would be my advice. And, and there's a lot of information gathering that has to go on. But there's some information available. There's some Indian states that do a good job telling you what's, what's happening there. And the ones that don't, you probably need to be a little bit suspicious of. So my, my more informative answer is obviously your sector matters. But what really matters is the, is the ge geographic operating environment and the rules that apply there. Um, don't think of India as India. Should I get into India? That's a mistake. Derek used to charge for that. Yes, a lot of money. So, I'll be sending let you me, money. Uh, so. you, you know, I want to... Uh, <laughs> I, I do want to sum up. It's been a terrific uh, conversation, uh, really. And, uh, you know, you made the point about Linda and Swami sitting next to each other. And it, it was funny because Derek said, um, Derek referenced the argument between uh, Linda and Swami. And then I, I realized that actually Linda's side, while you were speaking, Linda's side of the argument was conducted entirely in facial expressions. <laughs> <laughs> then she had that a, then she had an opportunity <laughs> later. But you know what? I, if I could, I just wanted to, to summarize by asking you, you a question. Uh, hopefully, each of you can respond to, which is, I, I think this argument actually boils down to letting the market decide. I mean, that's what will happen. So if India has its own approach, its own philosophy, its own history on IPR, it's free to go that way, and all the companies that may or may not invest are free to not invest, right? So. Um, you know, there are certain in the same in the same vein. I, I, uh, until very recently, and, and maybe we're still in this period, is there's been a certain hubris I think on the Indian side, which is this is where the opportunity is. You have to invest here. We were, we had Arun Jaitley here about two years ago, and he actually said that we we raised the issue of the nuclear power plants and you know the the impasse there, and he said, well, you got to come to us. So you can wait as long as you want. Eventually, you're going to have to invest here. Um, so what if Linda's right, and the investment does start to dry up because of these various problems that the companies are, are talking about. And, and, you know, I guess you just have to buy that premise. I, I guess you can argue it, too, if you want. But, I mean, if, if you just buy that premise that it could dry up as a result, then what happens? What, what do, how does India turn then? Does it turn to actually realize the error of its ways, or does it entrench further into sort of a socialist uh, political structure? Why don't we start with you, Sanjay? I, maybe I'm the optimist in the group, but I have a lot of faith in the Indian entrepreneurs. I, you know, whether it's a street hawker to Mukesh Ambani to others, uh, you know, we have a saying in India that says India succeeds despite the government, Ch China succeeds because of the government. Um, so the Indian entrepreneur will find a way. Um, and when you look at the demographics of India, the young, People now have a certain expectation um, of a job, 
of a mall, of a certain kind of a lifestyle. So choices, uh, so when you start looking at states, I mean, Derek uh, keeps coming to that, and he kind of alludes to doing work with states that have reasonably good governance. And I think that is going to be pushed upwards. Um, so maybe I'm uh, fairly positive. Uh, just the internal numbers alone should get India 5 to 6% growth, but that's obviously not going to be enough for them. So uh, I think the investment will maybe peter down a little bit, but I think it will come back because India has, because of its entrepreneurs, has an innate ability to change and adopt just like maybe not as fast as we do in America here. But, may, uh, but they will because of the young people and because of the entrepreneurs. Okay, thanks. Anything, Linda, or any other summary statement? I, I, I would like to be hopeful because I, I do, as, as someone who works in the world of international trade, I am always, always an optimist because we have lots of debates here in the United States that uh, you need to keep that, that optimism. Um, I am hopeful that we're not going to come to that point. Right? I am hopeful that we get to a point where the U.S. and Indian governments, with the help of the private sectors of both the United States and India, can figure out a way to reverse this course. And uh, I'll let Derek talk about the broader um, economic uh, social issues in, in India. But I, I, I'm hopeful that this can be done. If it doesn't, I, I can't comment on what India will do, and you know, companies will make their own choices based on, on how they see the market. I will just point out that the level of investment competitiveness is growing. We've seen it over the last decade, um, and lots of governments are very interested in growing their economies by attracting foreign investment. You know, Mexico is attracting investment that otherwise would have come to the United States because it has done more free trade agreements and the effective rate of its tariffs on its exports is less than the United States. Those are some of the factors, depending on the industry and the sector, that companies are looking at. And in a world where we've seen in the last year a very significant decline in, in foreign direct investment flows, um, I, I think it, it likely will have an impact on, on India's choices. Yeah. The Arun Jetli attitude is a very generalized one, simply because I said, I said, do you know foreign investment will dry up? And the answer is, since it never came, there is nothing to dry up. It is not the case that India achieved 8.5% growth because there was a flood of foreign investment. Very little came. In other words, foreign investment was not a necessary condition uh, for eight and a half percent growth, and if it falls, I mean, I think it, uh, you, you could uh, deciphering the foreign direct investment figures a little difficult because all reinvested profits of companies already in India are now being included in FDI. So you know that's distinct from the flow that's coming from outside. But the total flows tend to be you know 20, 30, 40 billion dollars. Now this is you know one to two percent of GDP. That's all. Now, I, it's a valuable investment which I would be all for. I would love to see it go up. I'm merely pointing out that if India is a country having an investment rate of 35 to 40 percent of GDP, whether that additional 1 percent or 2 percent comes in while it's welcome, it is not critical to the overall structure. I would love to have that double. But I said it's not critical. So, you know, we've always, it has never been a good country for, for foreign investment. Always against. The guys who come in are the adventurers. The Koreans, I mean, the Japanese were sick with uh, apprehension. Can we really come in with all these things? The Koreans said, what the hell? We're going to take a chance. And they jumped in and they beat the Japanese high style. They did extremely well in India. So, you know, it was sufficiently entrepreneurial to do it. I know the Japanese hated the idea of coming into it. The <coughs> Americans were, in fact, much more adventurous than the Japanese. <laughs> the, Japanese the Japanese were even more worried about India than the Americans are. But I said, we never got very much. Therefore, the notion of, you know, do you know foreign investment will dry up, that is a non-argument. You need to understand that. Uh, can I just reconcile these two things? Um, I think that's exactly right. I agree with Swami about the past. I think India's future is more tied up with the world than its past has been. If there's going to be jobs for the expanding um, young population, 
they the the standard way those jobs is created is manufacturing. The population is going to move inexorably. The Indian market is probably not going to move inexorably. That leads to a model of manufacturing exports. And if you alienate your trade partners, given how protectionist the world is already, it's going to be harder for India's surplus labor to serve the world. So I agree that in the past. Um, the, the India is a big economy. The decisions that are made within India matter much more to India than, than its, I said that at the beginning, than its external policies. Um, and that was my main point in closing my argument. That is actually going to become less true, I think, over time. Because the, the big thing for India is going to be to create jobs for its people. Services is not going to be enough to do that. You're going to have to do it in manufacturing. India has a lot to offer the world in terms of manufacturing exports. But if, you po if that relationship is poisoned, whoever's fault it is, and you know, change on a country by country basis, that relationship is poisoned. It hurts the world, but it's going to hurt India a lot. Whereas in the past, foreign was like foreign foreign participation was kind of a luxury. Now, open markets for Indian manufacturing goods, if indeed India can get its manufacturing sector together, are a necessity. So I'll go back to what India has to do for itself has to come first. After that, to take full advantage of those reforms, India needs the world more than it did, say, 10, 15 years ago. Great, thanks. Well, I'm going to end on a hopeful note, which is um, the greatest thing about U.S.-India relations is that we have this kind of interaction. You know, there's pl always plenty of people to argue with in India. Um, and if we're not arguing with the Indians, they're arguing with each other. <laughs> so uh, that, that, is, does what make it, that is what makes it great. I, I do want to just make, thank our panelists, but also especially thank Sanjay for, thank for co-hosting the program today. I hope it's um, something we can do much more of. Absolutely. Thanks a lot. Thank, thank you. you all for coming. Thank you. 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 Thank you